Before we get into verse 18 of Colossians chapter 1, I want to take a moment to get sort of a bird's eye view of this overall passage between verses 15 through 20. Um, a lot of people call this section the hymn or a poem or a creedal confession, um, a chiasm, um, which was just a, sort of a literary device used by ancient authors in order to highlight a specific truth that the author wanted you to understand. Um, some people say that this was something that was already in use by the early church when, when Paul wrote this letter and that Paul had sort of inserted it here because it fit well with what he was trying to communicate. Others say, no, Paul composed this um, chiasm or poem or hymn or creedal confession um, in order to uh, communicate the truth he was trying to communicate and that um, it would have been used later for um, a hymn or confession or whatever. Um, we don't have any way of knowing that, but one thing we can say for certain is that there are definitely there's definitely order and patterns of thought in this section between verses 15 and 20, sort of a repeating pattern. Um, in verses uh, 15 through 17, um, we see Paul hiding, highlighting the truth of Christ's identity as the creator and his work in the new creation. And then in verses 18, 19, and 20, we, we see Paul highlighting Christ's work in the new creation. The reason we want to go over this really, though, is to understand why Paul was inserting this into the letter in this place. Um, remember that the Colossians were actually facing several um, heresies that were beginning to make inroads into the church in this first century. This was a fairly new church with fairly new believers, and Paul's writing this letter not as an angry letter or a rebuke, but really um, it's a kind of a joyful letter. Um, encouraging brand new believers and also sort of trying to stop this heresy in its tracks and make sure that these um, brand new believers in this brand new church get a good foundation um, to move forward in their faith and their journey with Christ. And so remember the, um, the main heresy that was starting, sort of starting to come into this early church was, was a kind of pre-Gnostic heresy. It had to do with the worship of uh, angels, uh, other spiritual beings, and seeking um, spiritual visions in order to experience the fullness of the divine. And Paul's coming against this heresy with the full force of the, the authority and the theology and understanding of Christ that, that Christ himself had given to him. Um, and so he comes out and he says this, look, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, vis visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Paul, in this section of 15, 16, and 17, is basically saying, look, Christ is God. He's the author of creation. He's the agent through which God the Father created by, through, and for uh, all things in the heavens and the, and the earth. He's sovereign. He's supreme. He is Lord over all creation, okay? And not only did he create all things by, through, and for Christ, um, but, but in Christ, um, all things are hold together. In other words, he created everything and he also sustains everything by his power because Christ is God. That's what he means by he's the image of the invisible God, the first one over all creation, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the creator of the whole creation. He not only created it, but he sustains it. And then in verse 18, 19, and 20, Paul begins to go into Christ's work in the redemption, the new creation, if you will. And so in verse 18, he says, and he is the head of the body, the church, the, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to, to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to, him, to himself in heaven and in the earth, uh, making peace by the blood of his cross. Okay, and so here Paul's highlighting, saying, look, he is not only the creator of all creation and the sustainer of all, all creation, but he is also the head of the body, the church, and he's the firstborn of the dead, um, that in everything, okay, both the creation and the recreation, he may have the preeminence or be supreme, okay? For in him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things in heaven and on earth to himself. So we see repeating patterns here. In the first section, he's the firstborn over all creation. The second section, he's the firstborn uh, from the dead. Okay, In the first section, he's the image of the invisible God. In the second section, in him, all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. In the, in the first section, it says that by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. And in the second section, the, it says that the Father through him is reconciling all things through, to himself, both in heaven and on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so we see these repeating patterns. And Paul's goal and aim here is to give you the full picture of who Jesus truly is. Okay, 
His kingdom is not just the first century church. His kingdom is not just the church, the body. His kingdom is everything because he created all things, both in heaven and on earth, both the physical universe and the spiritual world. All angels, all demons, all spiritual entities were created by Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. And he sustains even them by his power. And he redeems all things in the heavens and on the earth to himself, making peace by the blood of Jesus' cross. Okay, and so all things, he's the Lord over all creation. He's sovereign over all creation. He's the author and the agent over all creation. He's also the Lord, the God, the sovereign, the author and the agent over all of recreation. And all things were made for him. And so when he comes back, he's actually going to fully consummate his kingdom on this earth. He's going to reconcile all things to himself. In other words, in the day of judgment, he's going to judge those who are worthy of judgment. He's going to fully redeem those who are his body, and he's going to make all things new. And he's not going to stop there. He's going to rule and reign over that creation, his inheritance for all eternity. Okay, and so this is who Christ is. And Paul's point here is this. Look, you don't need anything outside of Christ. In fact, anything outside of Christ is to worship the creation over the creator. And so you need to worship Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He is God and sovereign over all things. And if this is true or because this is true of him, now this is how we ought to live. Because we see him for who he is and understand what he's done, now we understand who we are and what he has done on our behalf and how we should live in response to that. That's how that's going to progress through the rest of this uh, passage and through the rest of this letter to the Colossians. We'll get into verse 18 in the next video.